morning, Hope Nation. We pray that you are continuing to stay safe and healthy. And this morning, wherever you are in your homes or in your cars, listening or watching, we just invite you to join in our virtual worship service this morning. We have a very special guest that has come to lift up the name of the Lord this morning. So Hope Nation, I want to see those hands raised and those hands clapping, giving our great God some praise.
with lots of bright lights And I must admit that I felt like a star Living in big houses, driving fancy cars But what would it mean if there is no you? Yes. And how will I live if you never see me through? So what I'm saying is
Elevation, good morning. So good to see you. I know God's been good to you. I know he's been a way out of nowhere and a bridge over troubled waters. So we want to invite you right now, wherever you are, to just give the Lord a shout hallelujah, hallelujah. a hand clap of praise for how he's brought you this far. It's such a wonderful time for us to be together to celebrate his goodness. You're there, we're here. But guess what, Hope Nation? God is everywhere. And so we're so excited to join together to bless his holy name. Back there behind me, that's our wonderful music department up there in the bandstand. That's Marcus Walker and Mercy Mercy. Not Marcus Walker and Mercy, but Marcus Walker and Mercy, Mercy. Won't you thank God for them? And these wonderful singers right here. That's GH, Generation Hope. That's Ashley Ardwan's team. Got visiting with us today. World-renowned gospel artists all over the world came back to Hope Nation just to bless the Lord for you. That's Cheryl Thomas Fortune. Won't you thank God for her and her ministry? Uh, Monica Williams. Chauncey Kipney, Ashley Ardwan, Generation Hope. Our first lady wants to share some words with you. Won't you thank God for her? Amen, amen. Good morning, Hope Nation. So excited to be with you on today. Want to just share with you a word on today, and the word is pivot, pivot, pivot. Do you know what pivot is? Well, I've been watching some basketball, and I've noticed that as the players are going towards the basket, when they can't make the basket on the lane that they want to go, what they do is they pivot. And I want to tell you, Hope Nation and friends, sometimes we have to pivot. When you pivot, you just trust God in the process. When you pivot, you understand that you are going to keep the course, but you have to pivot to make sure <laughs> that you don't get bumped into by certain things. So if that's good news to you, give the Lord a hand clap of praise and then just pivot, adjust your goals. But remember, God is with you. You don't have to adjust those goals because God is with you and just pivot. Amen, let's Amen. give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Let us prepare ourselves as we go to God in prayer. And as we are preparing ourselves, you will see the names of those who are, we are praying for that are going across the screen. So keep those in your prayers during this week. So let us bow our heads as we go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together and to just know that you are in the midst. So right now, we just say thank you, God. Thank you, God, for being our love. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy towards us, God. Lord, right now, we want to lift up those who are in need of healing. Touch them, Lord, from the top of their heads down to the soles of their feet. God, right now, we just pray for all of us who are going through this pandemic, God. Let us stay focused on you, the one that we can trust and the one who will provide all our needs. So, Lord, once again, we just say thank you. Lord, we continue to lift up our families to you, Lord, however they may be, God. Give everyone in that family speak words and peace and direction and guidance so that they can be the persons that you have called them to be. God, right now, we also want to just lift up those who are in search of employment, God. Remember that, let them remember that you are the great provider and that you will provide all their needs. So we just say thank you for that, God. God, right now, we just want to say we love you, God, and we honor you, God. God, as we continue to go through this time, we want to lift up our leaders and our, our troops to you, God. Please give them wisdom, direction, and guidance. And then, God, we will be sure to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It's in your precious son, Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen, first lady. God bless you. Just remember, don't quit. Stay the course but be willing and ready to pivot and know God still got you. What a wonderful word. I know you're encouraged, I know I am. If you got your Bibles, we invite you to turn to Exodus chapter three, verses one through eight, clause C. That's Exodus chapter three, verses one through eight. And if you can get, just get to that second 
the clause after the second punctuation mark. That's what we'll be reading and working from this morning. Please hear the word of the Lord. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the Lord God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The grass withers, the flower fades. For the word of our law will stand forever. The story of Moses that we see starting here in chapter 3 does not begin in chapter 3, but it begins again in chapter 3. When we find Moses in chapter 3, he is a man in need of a reset. His hard drive needs a reboot. He is a man whose life has drifted Of course, his life seems from all reasonable metrics, from every discernible indicator, to be headed in a direction different from where it has ended. How many of you know that being crowned the senior class prom queen is no guarantee that life will treat you like like a queen? In fact, more times than not, peaking too early is a guarantee of unpredictable and unfortunate vicissitudes just up the road and around the proverbial corner. Moses' life, like all of our lives, has been filled with undulations, twists and turns, highs and lows. In his case, the early preponderance of his highs has left him wholly unprepared for life's lows. He is a man with a remarkable chapter one of his biography, an enviable Tony Award-worthy first act. He is born to a Hebrew mother, and the Egyptian pharaoh has ordered his assassination even before he takes his first breath. He is to be drowned in the Nile River. The Egyptian midwives ordered to fulfill this morbid task disobey Pharaoh's proclamation and hide the fragile and vulnerable newborn child, giving him cover for three months while his mother ponders his future. The various Old Testament versions translate his mother's assessment of him as a fine or beautiful or special child. My prayer is that every parent would assess the destiny of his or her child by looking to the promise that that child possesses and see a fine and special child. At three months old, Moses is now too rambunctious to be safely hidden, and his mother is faced with a choice. Hold on to him and expedite his certain death, or give him up and give him a chance. She decides to give him a chance. She constructs for him a custom-built mini yacht 
specially designed to fit one three-month-old Hebrew boy that is too special to let die. She puts him in the Nile River to float on top of the very river that Pharaoh planned to drown him under. Pharaoh's daughter sees the floating yacht. She fetches it from the water and sees the special little immigrant Hebrew baby inside. Moses' sister has trailed behind on the shore and when she notices that Pharaoh's daughter has been captivated by the specialness of her little brother, she asks Pharaoh's daughter if she can get one of the Hebrew women to serve as a surrogate to nurse, to nurse her newly adopted son. Of course, she says yes, and Moses' sister brings Moses' mother to nurse her own Hebrew son under the royal protection of Pharaoh's own police force. I just want to stop for a moment to give somebody a chance to say, won't he do it? You may have already picked up on a pattern that every time Pharaoh tries one thing, God one-ups him by doing the opposite thing, only doing it better. The source of this one-sided robbery is that in chapter 1, verse 10, Pharaoh declared that he would deal shrewdly with God's people. Hope Nation, I tell you all the time that God hates slick. People say that God hates ugly, but that's not biblical. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, the servant was the craftiest, the slickest of all the animals in the garden. And God cursed the serpent for his slickness. God hates slick. God sets himself to deal with Pharaoh's shrewd machinations toward the people whom God has chosen. They're trying to be slick against you on your job, but God is watching. Slick stuff happening in your house, but God is watching. Slick stuff happening in the halls of justice and the politics in play to hold you back and deny you a place and a platform in a nation that your, your poor four parents built for free. God is watching, and God hates slick. And God sent me to tell you, that no weapon formed against you will prosper. Pharaoh has already down three games to none. And no sense keeping you in the suspense. This series is going to be a sweep, child of God. Pharaoh doesn't stand a chance. Moses' mother nurtures him while Pharaoh's daughter pays her with Pharaoh's own money for the privilege to nurse her own son. You should be reminded of the prayer of Asa in 2 Chronicles 14 that we looked at last week. There's no one like you, Lord, to protect the powerless from the mighty. As Professor James Cone reminds us in his seminal work in the field of liberation theology entitled God of the Oppressed, God distinguishes between the oppressed and the oppressor. And because God has a sense of humor, and loves a twist of faith, Moses is raised and pampered in the household of the Pharaoh who tried to assassinate him. He is a Hebrew by birth, but he's raised as an Egyptian, a Hebrew, literally a stranger, a foreigner, a sojourner, an immigrant. But he is not picking peas or cotton. He's kicking it in the palace, rubbing shoulders with the potentates. He speaks the language of the elite. He's trained to give orders. He's, his education is of the Ivy League variety. Every detail of his life is intentionally selected to groom him for success and for succession. But when we find him in chapter 3, he's a broken shell of his former self. The man for whom God has worked miracles is on the backside of a mountain, tending to a flock of sheep that are not his, but belong to another man. He is hired help. As he feeds those sheep, like the prodigal son feeding pigs, he surely must at the very least consider how far he has fallen and how much the course of his life has changed. And that leads us already 10 minutes in to our sermon topic for this morning, a setup for a comeback. Moses is living a life that he never saw coming. 
His educational mentoring and tutoring was designed to prepare him for everything, and yet nothing has prepared him for the depths to which he has fallen. He always assumed that his life would be different than it is, and for good reason. But sometimes life throws the unreasonable, the unexpected, and the unpredictable at you. Moses' life is broken. He is broken. And he started to age in a situation so different from his youthful expectations. You always want to make your mistakes when you're young enough and have enough time to bounce back. Moses is broken, aged, and the clock appears to be ticking on his destiny. He is out of place, and he knows it. He's living in a place called Midian, a place that, ha that he has no relational or family connection to. He's so aware that he is out of place that he names his son Gershom, which loosely translates a stranger in a foreign land. But it is not his son who is the stranger. His son was born in Midian to a midnight mother and to a midnight family of cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents. It is Moses who is the stranger and not his son. But Moses is in pain, pain he passes on, that he feels so deeply. He passes it on to his son in the name that he gives his son. Every time his son was called to come in for dinner or to come and take a bath, he hears, stranger, come eat. Foreigner, come take your bath. In this, our season to get better and do better, I keep reminding you, Hope Nation, that pain that is not transformed will be transferred. And Moses has settled for his painful plight. And he has perpetuated his perspective of limited prospects to his progeny. To his children, he is declaring that his plight is their plight. I am a stranger, a foreigner, an outcast, and so are you. And if I could stop preaching right here for a moment and make a pastoral plea, it would be Hope Nation, get it done, my friend, in one generation. Quarantine is spread so that your children have a fighting chance to deal with their own stuff without having to deal with your stuff too. Baby, this is mama's stuff. Honey, this is daddy's stuff. And I will stop it by any means necessary before it gets to you. Don't medicate your pain in front of your kids and leave them addicted to the ways you medicated the pain that you would not deal with. Moses is so consumed with his own circumstance that he is already planting the seeds of generational burden to pass on to his children. But, <laughs> somebody out there say, but one day, this day, we find Moses on an errand to feed Jethro's, his father-in-law's flock. His life is off course. He's trained in the Egyptian sciences and talking to Midian sheep on the backside of a mountain. Trained in Egyptian mathematics, geography, topography, and here he is charting the course to get hungry sheep from one green pasture to the next. And in the course of this trek to find green grass for his father-in-law's sheep, the Bible says a, bro a bush catches on fire. Now that would be a big deal here on the Gulf Coast where it's humid almost all the time because it's always wet here even when it's not raining. But Moses is in an arid place where the air is always hot and dry. And in hot and arid places, weeds combust. This bush catching on fire is not really worthy of his attention. But what is worth his attention is the fact that the bush starts to burn, but it won't burn up. It won't burn itself out. Because there is something about when God allows a thing to go on longer than we think it should that gets our attention. When we were sure that it would be over by now, but we are still in its throes, it gets our attention. I thought it would be over it by now. Over him by now. 
over her by now, over what they said by now, over how they treated me by now. Something about when things burn, but it won't, it seems, ever burn out. It's been burning inside of you for so long, and it just won't burn itself out. Something about prolonged adversity that turns men's and women's mind to God. The Bible says when God saw that Moses had turned aside to see, then God called out from the bush. God would not speak while Moses' attention was divided. He did not speak while Moses tweeted, Snapchatted, channel surfed, Netflixed, Facebooked, or YouTubed for that matter, unless of course he was watching Hope's virtual worship this morning. God watched him, but he did not speak until he had Moses' undivided attention. God says to him, Moses, Moses. Moses answered, here I am. He does not say, here I am, Lord, because Moses does not yet know who, he, who is speaking to him. But he does know where he is, and he says, here I am. It's not where I thought I would be at this point in my life, at this point in my career, at this point in my marriage, at this point in my ministry, but this is where I am. Let me tell you, Hope Nation, you are on your way to a healing when you can just admit that you are in a bad place. These are not my sheep, but here I am. These are not the clothes I used to wear, but here I am. I did not plan for my marriage to fall apart, but here I am. I did not think they would fire me, lay me off, force me into retirement after all of these years, but here I am. I did not plan to get addicted. I thought I was a social user, but here I am. And I need a word <laughs> for where I am, not for where I used to be or where I act like I am when other folks are looking, but I need a word for where I really am. Here, 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 right here, right where I am, Lord. I need a word for right here. Not in Egypt, but in Midian. Not in a palace, but in a pasture. Not a prince, but a pauper. Here I am. And God says to Moses, okay, Take your shoes off, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. You despise it, but it's holy ground. You find it humiliating, but it's holy ground. Because wherever God gets your attention is holy ground. The mortgage company may call it a foreclosure, but God calls it holy ground. The job may call it a staff reduction, but God calls it holy ground. The doctor may call it terminal, but God calls it holy ground. The Centers for Disease Control may call it the coronavirus or COVID-19, but God calls it holy ground. God says, take your shoes off. When Jesus was teaching his disciples how to deal with an inhospitable world, he says, if you go to a village and they don't treat you like you think you should be treated, you thought you would be welcomed and they did not welcome you. You thought they would respect you, but they don't respect you. Jesus says, before you leave to go to the next place, shake the dust of the last place off your feet. God is telling Moses, don't bring the dust of your disappointment into this place because this place is holy ground. This place is set apart for your future, not your past. It is different from where you have been before. It's holy ground. Don't bring that in here. About two years ago, I had a real smart dog, a Doberman. When it was time for him to come in, he would always try to bring in some stick or twig or bone that he had dug up and bring it in the house with him. I would say, stop. Don't bring that in here. He would go back outside and pace back and forth in front of the open door. He would decide, and if he wanted to hold on to some worthless relic and stay outside, or put it down and come inside. After a few moments, I would tell him, okay, you got 10 seconds to decide. And I would start counting down 10, 
nine, eight. I guess over time he had picked up on my cadence and he knew when the door was going to close and he would have to spend the night outside. So every time I would get to about three, he would drop whatever he was holding on and come rushing by me without pausing to even give me a look. He was saying to me, I know I can come in now because I have satisfied your condition. I left it outside. That is what God is telling Moses. He says, I got something new for you, but there is a condition. You can't bring the dirt of your disappointment with you. Take your shoes off. If you want to come back, you must shake off the dirt from your unresolved despair, the dust of delay that hurt your feelings. You can't bring a lingering dirt of disrespect in here. This is holy ground. Take your shoes off. No pouting here. Take your shoes off. No moping here. Take your shoes off. You can't bring it with you. I know they treated you dirty, but you can't bring it with you. I know they lied on you, but you can't bring it with you. I know they cheated you, but you can't bring it with you. Take your shoes off. You can't come into the re new relationship if you still leave the dirt of the old relationship. You have to leave it behind. Take your shoes off. God tells Moses, everything that you thought was wasted is still in play. Your education is still in play. Your leadership training is still in play. Your knowledge of geography and topography is still in play. Everything that you thought was wasted is still worthy. What you thought was disqualifying is pre-qualifying. You've been shepherding sheep because you will shepherd people. You've been a sojourner in a foreign land because you are going to lead my people through strange and foreign places. It has all been a setup. It's been a setup all alone. God told me to tell you, Hope Nation, you can't even imagine what God is getting ready to do with you. It might have knocked you down, but God is getting ready to pick you up. They may have put you on the sideline, but God told me to tell you that you are back in play. God told Moses, I want you to go back into Egypt and tell the Pharaoh who tried to kill you twice, once when you, once when you were a young baby, and then again, when you were a young man, tell him that you are still alive. It hurt you, but it did not kill you. It humiliated you, but it did not kill you. It delayed you, but it did not kill you. It set you back, but it did not kill you because it was a setup all along. God says, I want you to march back into Pharaoh's palace and tell him that Egypt's outlaw has become Yahweh's lawgiver and that you have come to tell him to let my people go. And Hope Nation, this is my favorite part. Moses asked God, who am I to tell Pharaoh to let your people go? And God answers, I will be with you. Theologians and Old Testament scholars debate, what question is God answering? You see, it doesn't seem to fit. Moses Ask God, who am I to bring your people out? And God says, I am with you. You see, I'm just a simple preacher from the hood of Fifth Ward, Texas, so I take it the way the Bible gives it. Who are you, Moses, to demand liberation from Pharaoh? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to start demanding real, tangible justice and equality a full 66 years after passing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to demand that the ugly Confederate tributes, the flags and the statues, to the worst of what it means to be American must come down? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to demand that your critical vote in the midst of this most epoch-shaping election in the last 50 years, be counted whether you vote by mail or in person. God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to, step, to stand up for equal pay, for equal work, and equal access to promotions and opportunities on your job? God is with me. That's who I am. 
Who do you think you are to, to, to declare that even if they bamboozle a whole generation, your child will be the head and not the tail, and your child will live above and not beneath? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to get free from the addiction that has held you captive for over 15 years? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are as a single parent to stand up to a biased system and declare that your child will not be a statistic? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to demand happiness in your marriage when you've never seen a happy marriage in your whole family? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to speak to the doctor's terminal diagnosis and declare I will live and not die? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to speak to COVID-19 and say you cannot have my help, you cannot have my hope, and you cannot have my joy? God is with me. That's who I am. Who do you think you are to speak to mental illness and disease that has impacted six generations of your family and declare that you will have joy unspeakable and peace that surpasses all understanding? God is with me. That's who I am. Whole nation, God told me to tell you, you've been set up for a comeback, and God is with you. That is who you are. And that, my friends, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hope Nation visitors, friends, if you've been with us today and listened to this word, and you wonder, you say, Pastor, I heard the promises. There's a point in my life where I'm ready to fall, reset myself. Can God guarantee that for me? Well, my Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust, which means you can get an overflow blessing. But if you need a covenantal blessing, then you have to be in right relationship with God. We call that justification. That's where God treats you like all the things that you've done, as if you never did it. You say, well, I need a restart. I need a reboot in my life. What do I have to do? Well, Paul tells the Romans in his letter to them that you have to confess with your mouth. What do you believe in your heart? That Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. That means redeemed, to be bought back and brought back. And so we're going to give you an opportunity right now. I'm not going to bait and switch you, but I'll give you an opportunity to confess with your mouth as an overflow of your heart that you're ready to accept Jesus Christ into your life. And if you do that and take my word for it, everything changes. So right now, if you're ready, pray this prayer with us. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we believe, we decree, we declare, and we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He came, he lived, he bled, he suffered, and he died, that we might have life and life more abundantly. We also believe, decree, declare, and confess that on the third day, you raised Jesus from the dead. Now my Bible says if you pray that prayer with your mouth and mean it in your heart, even though you were lost a moment ago, you've been found. That entitles you to all the promises in 66 books so many that we cannot even count them. But one of the promises is that your God is with you and he'll never leave you and never forsake you. And so if that's good news to you, wherever you are, just give God a hallelujah and an amen. amen. At this time, we're gonna invite the first lady to come back up and while she's coming, we want you to know that in a very few minutes, about 10, we'll be having drive-by giving, one hour of fellowship where you can come and Give your offering, your offertory worship in person. Somebody will be out front. They'll have on a mask and some gloves. They'll be six feet away from you, so they'll be socially distant. 
and you can honor God through your tithes and offerings. If you would prefer, you can do that online or you can see the address on the screen and feel free to mail it in. The postal service to get it here and God will put it on your account. First Lady, you got anything for the people? Just want to let you know that we miss you and we look forward to seeing you soon. Hallelujah. We miss you like crazy and we got mad, mad love for you. Yes. Hope Nation, our closing confession is, and my God shall supply all my needs, all my needs, all my needs, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. We love your Hope Nation and we want you to know that your best is yet to come. Amen. Amen.